Buenas tardes. Es un placer Good afternoon. Acompañaros esta tarde. It's a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. En documenta en Instar, en documenta eh, Instar Square, en documenta. Mi nombre es Suzette Sánchez y me gustaría hablarles hoy. My name is Suzette Sánchez. De las relaciones de Instar con. And I would like to talk with you today about Instar's uh, connections to a process of civic pedagogy in Cuba that is currently emerging and which is in a way uh, setting the basis for a process of change in the island. I would like to begin this conversation by reading a text by the philosopher Marina Garcés from her book, eh, Escuela de Aprendices, or School no for Apprentices. Saber it says, we don't Tampoco want to learn your fearful knowledge. We are also not guided by the maps of the prisons of the possible. Bureaucracy, cynicism, and opportunism are the bread by which minds are enslaved, desires are brittle, and challenges are domesticated. We do not want to learn how to calculate the price of anxiety. We want to forge the forms of knowledge that fight against the oppressions of our world, because we never know enough if what we want is to make a better world. And we never know everything is we are moved by never giving up. Because we carry the impulse of this desire and the wealth of this diversity of world. Our is, ours is the voice of apprentices, those for whom to learn is an enduring form of commitment. Our challenges are both humble and demanding. Their point of departure is the world's prime material. Their horizon, one that can be sketched by the ideas of a city school under the open skies. Police dickhead. The Ascanel, fuck you. These were angry shouts that filled the streets of the cities and towns of an entire island during the long and historical day of July 11, 2021. From the early hours during a warm Sunday, the people of San Antonio de los Baños took over public spaces, never before, not even during the summer of 1994, during what is known as the rafters uh, crisis and the maleconazo in central Havana, had Cuba experienced such a large popul expression of popular discontent. The revolt was gradually activated from province to province virally, spontaneously, replicated from one place to another through the driving contagion of social media and urged by the disappointment of a population that is exhausted of dealing with precarity, frustrated by economic reverses and reverses in terms of uh, rights, civil rights and civil liberties during the past few years. The energy was so great that it was empowered in the bodies and became palpable on the, on the streets all through Sunday and resonating during the following days. The protest was so wide that police forces and state security were unable to repress it before it took place, as usually happens with actions by opposition movements, which are quenched and repressed before they happen, thanks to the permanent control and surveillance of activists. The thousands of Cubans of all ages who dared to march that day down avenues and small streets demanding justice and the right to a worthy life, they were not paid by the United States. They were not following orders other than those that came from their own consciousness in a desperate attempt to survive. 
desde los adolescentes y the bodies that were crowded on the streets, including teenagers and minors and grandmothers, were the bodies of disappointed citizens abandoned by a government that has not known how to respond to the most basic needs of a population that is depressed after decades of poverty and the involution of the social achievements that came after the Cuban Revolution triumphed in 1959, mainly in the fields of education and public health. The visceral nature and slang of statements like police dicks or the Ascanel fuck you was in contrast with the gestures of bodies that raised their arms to the skies, signifying the pacific, the peaceful nature of the protest. On November 27, also the bodies of young students, artists, and intellectuals sitting on the stairs in front of the Ministry of Culture in another unprecedented demonstration of dissent was the clear sign of a demand for a conversation and nonviolent mediation, an appeal to negotiation and understanding between the citizenship and the state. Indeed, when on July 11th, police agencies tried to qualm the protest through violence, the response by some people who were engaged in the protests took on the morphologies of urban guerrillas. Typical of confrontations between protesters and police forces in other geopolitical contexts, sitting or lying down on the street, singing, dancing, asserted the peaceful gesture, gestuality that drove the revolt before violence was unleashed. The slogans, police, dickheads, fuck the Escanel, fatherland and life, come from the popular imagination, the joyful celebration that is part of the Cuban idiosyncrasy or the witty critique that emerges from the desarcalization of power. Hey, dickhead police is a statement that became a viral on YouTube through a video uploaded by a young woman who taped with her phone a carnival-like celebration. A few days later, the rappers Marichal and Darielo Sanchez published a rap song, a protest rap song, titled Hey, Dighead Policeman, which has been uh, seen hundreds of thousands of times on YouTube. The statement Fuck the Ascanel also comes from the verses of a rap song by El Aldeano and Silvito El Libre. Likewise, Fatherland and Life is part of a hymn of resistance coming from a song performed by Yotuel Romero, Gente de Zona, De Semer Bueno, Michael Osorbo, and El Funky. How can you ask people to speak correctly after six decades of the violent grammar of the official discourse? The statement, dickhead police, sung by the crowds in despair, in a sense is a response to the patriarchal logic of the state's punitive uh, practice, which has indoctrinated the population through ongoing uh, boasting, testosterone boasting. The violent control of this totalitarian regime over its uh, citizens carries a masculine seal and stages its phallocentrism in public space. Indeed, this response, fatherland and life, is embodied by the voices and gestures of Afro-descendant men. There are no women, female participants, who could dislocate this uh, performance of masculinity and change the slogan fatherland or death into motherland and life. 
In his essay, Virtuosity and Revolution, Paolo Virno claims the crowd obstructs and dismantles mechanisms of political representation. It expresses itself as a set of active minori minorities, none of which aspires to become a majority. It develops a power that is resistant to the idea of becoming a government. The people who went out uh, on the streets in Cuba on July 11, 2021, is fully aware that they have been deprived of every, everything, even fear. To paraphrase another statement often found on social media, parents have been deprived of coexisting with their daughters and sons who have been forced to seek a, an alternative life in exile. Grandparents don't know their grandchildren who are born in diaspora. The public health system and the public education systems are now in an enduring crisis, which has led new generations into a dead end street. In the meantime, the utopia of social equality wanders through the neighborhoods as the ironic ghost of the socialist project. How many generations have been lost in Cuba? The generation of our parents who were born in the 1950s is lost in the nostalgic remembrance of the past that they constructed and that was suddenly interrupted. Another part of that generation has lived divided between the island and exile. How many lives have been lost in the Florida, Florida Strait and more recently in the Central American jungles? Don't those bodies count as disappeared as a result of state terrorism? Weren't they forced to escape? For my generation, those of us who grew up between the 70s and 80s, skepticism has been a travel companion as we wander through the world, having forced to reinvent ourselves in, in solitude and carrying the burden of responsibility for our families, sending money and occasional medicines. At our current age, we are more and more concerned with the health of our pa fathers and mothers, how to organize their care from such a distance. We find out uh, about the death of our relatives by a phone call or an email, and we are unable to accompany and embrace our families in mourning. Sometimes a WhatsApp video call is the sole available ritual to say goodbye to them. But our generation is also that of those who have not wanted or not been able to migrate. Those who are condemned to the geographic fatalism of water everywhere, which Virgilio Piñera used to describe the ontology of the island, do what they can to survive. A generation that has been forced to engender life in spite of the circumstances of an endless crisis that has only gotten worse. Their children are born sentenced. Marina Garcés has stated, quote, every once in a while a generation is lost, just like a harvest is lost, or a battleship during a night storm. These are the soldiers fallen in a war with no battles. Since then, loss has become a condition con that, that is, can be foreseen and is constant. No future is no longer a shot of protest. It's a fate that can only be managed with greater or lesser fear." End of quote. A project of civic pedagogy in the present time for the future time. These are Tania Bruguera's words to explain the nature of INSTAR. This project focuses on how people can lose fear in a peaceful way, a peaceful and constructive way. It's about creating bridges of trust with no fear from, toward others, creating a, a peaceful response and responsible response instead of violence creating a place where people with different political beliefs can come together to build a better country." End of the quote. In Tania Bruguera's long and winding path, 
to artistic, intellectual, and citizenship uh, maturity translated by the foundational gesture of INSTAR, we have to situate some landmarks that support her epistemic twists and her expansion of the structural notions of the artistic field and the role of art by widening the frames of possibility of aesthetics and the forms of the political that art can embody have responded to particular contingent circumstances of social tension in specific historical contexts in Cuba and elsewhere. A brief outline of this transformative experience should include projects like the independent newspaper Memories of the Post-War, published in 1993, 1994, and 2003. The first two issues of this publication with contributions by artists, writers, and intellectuals in exile were published in the hardest years of the so-called special period. And right before one of the most fatidical um, migrations in the recent history of the nation, after 1989, when real socialism collapsed in Eastern Europe and the economic support of the Soviet Union was lost, Cuba faced a deep depression, economic depression during the 1990s. One of the population's escapist alternatives was migration. In the context of the arts, many artists went into exile. It is estimated that almost an entire generation that had constituted neo-vanguard art of the 1980s. In 1994, the second issue of Memoria de la Posguerra was published and censored, the same year of what is known as the Rafters Crisis, the massive exodus of over 30,000 Cuban people towards the United States in makeshift uh, vessels, which left many people dead and disappeared in the sea. We could also mention Tatlin's Whisper number no. 6. It is well known how Bruguera was subjected to intensified repression and surveillance, being deprived of the freedom to move, being prevented from leaving the country, being imprisoned or temporarily detained, and smear campaigns since uh, late 2014, when Tania Bruguera tried to organize in Revolution Square her performance, Tatlin's Whisper. Also, Instar has been boycotted and her attempt to perform in the 12th uh, Havana Biennial in 2015 in what was uh, Instar's uh, foundational gesture uh, reading aloud during 100 hours Hannah Arendt's uh, crucial book, The Origins of Totalitarianism. There are other examples, such as long-term projects that Bruguera has been involved for the past two decades, the Behavior Arts Cathedra, the International Migrant Movement from 2010 to 2015, and the Party of Migrant Peoples, also 2010, 2015. All of these civic experiments or collective platforms of social action promoted by Tania Bruguera have been a focus within the concept of useful art, which she has developed as the foundation for a public pedagogy and of community artivism whose task is to alphabetize participants in methodologies for social democratic intervention and defending the rights of uh, citizenships in situations of exclusion or vulnerability of civil liberties. Mariana Garcés has warned about the deep crisis of education under the conditions of global capitalism under the currents of neoliberalization and cronyism. 
los totalitarios. But her concerns can also be applied to an other kind of uh, education, which is conservative and totalitarian. I quote, what is at stake is who can shape the skills that will determine the futures of societies that do not see themselves reflected in ongoing in, in valid institutions. Who is the state to educate our children when we are living um, lives chosen from a menu? What cultural hegemonies are valid for everyone in societies that are not only diverse, but more and more segregated and ghettoized? What is the authority of a teacher over decisions that families regard as private decisions? End of quote. If we relate this to the Cuban context, it is easy to see that these questions introduce a growing gap in a system whose very ontology uh, completely di diverges from plural conceptions and any inclusive paradigm. This impacts current historical circumstances where the alleged equality of socialism has completely cracked. Nonetheless, the idea of the school and of learning in Cuba are still under the control of ideological dogmatism. Additionally, the Ministry of Education is in, engaging and is enduring a prolonged crisis. In response to this, INSTAR it's a project for civic alphabetization within Cuban society, knowing how complex this task can be, given 60 years of authoritarianism and monolithic thought enforced by violent imposition by the state. This is how INSTAR defines its mission. I quote, in INSTAR, we are going to walk with everyday Cubans, include from housewives to professionals, from activists to students. The idea is to have a sample of Cuban society with people coming from very different political backgrounds and educational levels. We want to work with the people who will handle every day the construction of democracy in Cuba, demanding their rights and fighting for social justice in their schools and jobs, transforming spectators into active citizens. This is a unique moment to think the concept of nation, to imagine a new country because ideas are still in formation. There is space for all of us to participate. And since art allows us to transform a chaotic, chaotic vision into an encounter with an unexpected order, a new order, we can articulate a new future from there. It is about creating bridges of trust with no fear towards others, creating a peaceful response and a responsible response where there is violence, of creating a place where people with different political beliefs can come together to build a better future. End of the quote. In a place uh, dominated by totalitarian propaganda and the single party ideology, De determining what it means to belong to the nation, INSTAR, INSTAR's pedagogical project has as a point of departure acknowledging the plurality of Cuban society with no distinctions regarding class, gender, race, sexual orientation, educational level, religion, ideology, place of uh, residence, or migratory status. In fact, if we consider, if we remember the images that we saw on social media of the masses protesting on the streets on last July 11th, we find this very same diversity of bodies and subjectivities that INSTARS brings into the fold of its educational engagement. It is a task whose reason for being is most urgently visible in the precarized and stigmatized neighborhoods and subjectivities of Cuba's population. According to Marina Garcés, I quote, education can be understood as a set of practices that, make, that, that transform necessity into a condition for freedom. The education is the task of transforming what is given, what there is, what we are, 
into the capacity to go beyond immediate subordination. So we talk about emancipatory education whose horizon is to allow each person to be capable of thinking for themselves, alongside others, the problems of their own time. Freedom understood as a condition of collective dignity, emancipation as a process that is always in dispute regarding the conditions of domination of each age. After 60 years of intolerance and ideological control, the Cuban state has created the diagram of a projected socialist nation based on innumerable exclusions. These exclusions include important intellectuals, artists, writers, filmmakers, musicians, scientists, athletes. Typically, exile is used as the tool to exclude. More recently, the exile of the artist Hamlet La Bastida and the writer Catherine Bisquet. Daniel Bruguera took advantage of these dynamics to negotiate her own departure which the regime so hoped for under the condition that political prisoners be released, including La Bastida and other artivists and oppositors who are still in prison, like the creator Luis Manuel Otero Alcantara or the rapper Michael Castillo, who are part of the San Isidro movement. These names and groups like the San Isidro on 27N is no coincidence since the crucial fact here is to consider the meaning of these demonstrations of dissent and activism as the condition of possibility for instar's actions and its effort to become a space for care and affectivity where all lives matter regardless beyond any pattern of exclusion based on the state's operations. This is why the Institute offers a physical context for gathering and community, a cultural space that welcomes all expressions, all di different expressions of Cuba's civil society with no restrictions and sharing an awareness of the limitations and possibilities that each agency embodies in its singularity and alliance. Therefore, INSTAR emerges as a laboratory for accompanying and watching over overseeing processes that are trying to think and promote social change. Through its working network established thanks to more than 30, three decades of uh, Tania Bruguera's professional trajectory, is building tools, resources, and connections for a situated citizen's pedagogy. The relevance of this task in a totalitarian context in times of transition is, clear, is clear, clearly in view. In light of recent events, which involve agents named above and the seeds of a civic uh, society and the population taking responsibility, it is crucial to unlearn the warlike rhetoric and the discourse of terror inoculated by state propaganda and to activate creative forms of the political and of imagination to overstep the margins of discourse and be transformed into concrete rehearsals for alternative social objectivations. INSTAR is today in Cuba a place where it is possible to enact the irreverent and utopian gesture of imagining another possible island and its many alternative future futures. We agree with Marina Garces in saying that, quote, to imagine is to place yourself in suspension to connect to those who are not strangers. To imagine is to encompass everything that is not yet today and those who are yet to arrive. Thus, to imagine is a condition to harbor existence in all of its strange, strangeness, end quote. Incubating imagination, rehearsing change. The greatest current uh, risk to the perpetuation of the Cuban government in power is that resistance has already taken over the streets and dissent is being expressed by young voices who are learning the morphologies of democratic dialogue and peaceful revolt. 
This is a generation that is no longer afraid and that no longer wishes to be silent before injustice. Also, there are alliances, collaborations, and horizontality and solidarity emerging from the different agents involved in this radical disagreement. And this is a sign that there might be a consensus about the common good. The role of INSTAR is located in this learning stage. And this is why the project and its promoters, especially Tania Bruguera, have been targeted by censorship, surveillance by state security, and continuous police harassment. In start, essentially works with the potential forms of political subjectivity that can be intuited in the desires, dreams, and hopes of people. With those zones of social action that arise out of citizens' discontent, their capacity to react can be found in identifying what Bruguera calls a specific political moment. I quote, this is a method that is connected to and depends from politi exist political circumstances that exist at the time when the work is being produced or exhibited. It is a kind of work created to exist in a given political moment, and therefore, once this moment has passed, the work loses its potential political impact and tends to become a document of a particular political moment. The political moment informs the work, transforming it into a structure that must adapt itself to the evolution of political events and their interpretations. End of the quote. In that sense, the material used by INSTAR is responsive to contingency situations that are located in a particular local time and context with temporary affectionate communi af communities of affect that come together strategically in a struggle and the common experience of learning. In this case, it amounts to knowing how to respond to the privileges of bureaucracy, power, and its disciplinary institutions. This learning includes learning the legal frameworks of dissident action in a system that offers no juridical guarantees and where citizens have don't have access to even the most basic rights. In such a context, it is crucial for the survival of artivists and citizens to know what other resources, tools, and networks are available to them. More so when the state's recent uh, repressive attacks have placed uh, artists, journalists, and intellectuals as key targets of political persecution and repression, which means that the apparent margin of autonomy available to symbolic practices in Cuba um, is now restricted as such. Thus, the tactical importance of the model of the incubator as INSTAR's working structure, potentially based on the concept of sponsorship, as is found in technological enterprises, the Institute's incubator is understood as a transversal area of supporting ideas, projects, and actions from its initial stages with continuous accompaniment and advisory in order to make the project viable and place it within a sustainable ecosystem where it may grow, undergo criticism, and develop. Thus, the incubator is a safe space of effective complicity and discursive complicity where, we, where the contents of imagination are rehearsed and the ways of realizing it are explored advisory, tutorial support, economical support, a physical workspace, shared, legal orientation, and management orientation, facilitation of testing exercises in the public sphere, etc., are some of the many tasks that the incubator format takes on to channel the Institute's educational role. Currently, there are three incubators, the incubator of desires, the incubator of ideas, and the incubator of action. The first of them, the incubator of desires, is conceived as an extension of Tania Bruguera's series 
Tatlin's whisper. I quote, a space where any Cuban person can give voice to their opinions, share their yearnings, their expectations for the country where they live, in complete freedom and with respect to the other's opinion, end quote. In this case, the purpose of the incubator uh, retains the spirit of Tatlin's Whisper number six, Daniel Bruguera's action performed in the 10th Havana Biennial in 2009, where participants were allowed to speak for a minute with no censorship out of microphones that are usually reserved to the discourse of power. This is the same performance that uh, Bruguera tried to organize in 2014 in the Mythical Revolution Square, and which led to her being detained by the state security. In this case, the incubator is structured as a place for listening, a context where acts of enunciation are possible against the grain of the autocratic monologue of the Cuban regime. A listening of all voices and all lives. The capacity and exercise of listening is the, is the first condition to become sensibilized into the logics of a democratic culture. The purpose is to amplify a popular voice, the voice of a people far beyond a House of Representatives, which in Cuba's government schema is a mediocre puppet theater with no attention to the true urgencies and needs of the population. This listening is not exclusively predisposed to affirmative enunciations or to answers. It is open to doubt, uncertainty, the dubious language sown by a fear experienced by people who have endured the countless violences of a totalitarian regime. This listening is not only paying attention to the content of the discourse, but also, and first and foremost, to its forms, the plural different ways in which a voice can be projected as a bare whisper, unstable whisper, or exteriorizations of anxiety, even crying. These are infinite modes of appeal, signals and performativities that translate the desires, aspirations, and fears of our subjectivities. These are the signs that will be heard. The questions with no possible answers, which will be the object of our reflection and work. The task of this incubator is to learn listening, to learn to listen to the other beyond a relationship determined by hegemony and subordination, to hear beyond the deafening noise of the pamphleteering state propaganda and its epic narratives, to hear being receptive through all of the organs of our body because the order of discourse reaches beyond the contingent conditions of rationality and language, to learn to listen to ourselves, our ailments, our frailnesses, and to distinguish the oppressions that condition us and traverse us in order to think of how to transform them into a mobilizing energy and an agency for change. In that sense, listening requires a place where it can take place, but also it also requires a time of its own that does not constrain the rhythms of each speaking, whispering person. It is the time of patience where we understand the cadences of each of our voices and we train our bodies to encompass other metrics, the internal movements of our own bodies, the movements of breathing, of beating, of any physiological or natural process, and those of other species with whom we coexist every day. To train that skill prepares us to understand and play a role in the temporality of social processes and opens us to collective listening. Thus, the incubators are places for the spiritual and political growth of citizens, where you might find adequate conditions for the formation of skills and attitudes of apprentices, as Mariana Garcés understands the term. So incubators could be what Garcés calls schools for apprentices, 
I quote, this idea is not projected in a model. It becomes concrete in a perspective that changes one's point of view, a decided action that alters the experience of learning and its regime of expectation. Its sense is to make the unequal equal through an alliance that transforms education into the art of bringing existences together different existences in an action that equalizes equalizes them without standardizing them, taking the risk of learning together, that is to say, to learn with the others and from the others through the awareness of what we know and what we do not know. This is the core of education as a poetics and politics of existence, end of the quote. In this common learnage, we may find the questions that could provide us with an X-ray of the present to diagnose the political capacity embodied by our own bodies, that is to say, the agents and vehicles of change for social reality. Again, Garces, quote, to ask how we want to be educated means to be able to ask what futures we can imagine and with which pasts we want to connect. Education is an art of existence because it remakes the experience of time against the dictatorship of what is and of what must be. End of quote. This is why the system of incubators plays such an important role in InSTAR's working through workshops and open calls and also by activating projects protected by the Institute allow, allow us to develop a cartography of the present and to compile an archive of past practices and people excluded by official censorship. This willingness to work at the intersection of the past, the present, and the future renders the Institute's research dynamics into the seed for, the imagine, for imagining other forms of doing and thinking the common good for all lives. Through that collective learning, it seems like it is not altogether an utopia to reimagine the forms of the political at particular scales and community contexts, ecosystems in transition where it seems more and more possible to rehearse the transformative pedagogy of a city school under the open skies. Perhaps the assault on heaven begins in that small little blue piece of the sky that we see when we raise our heads in, in the internal patio of a house in the Havana street of Tejadillo, where INSTAR develops its work. I would like, you, I would like us to continue this conversation using the social media through INSTAR's uh, social media platforms on YouTube and Facebook. Hopefully, we can continue to discuss the hope that a project such as INSTAR entails for Cuba's civil society nowadays. Thank you.